Today I want to move on to actually looking at the first example of a particular separation technique that we can actually use. So last week we mentioned one of the options <coughs> for an added phase type of separation was liquid-liquid extraction. So today, essentially, I'm going to go through and I'm going to introduce liquid-liquid extraction to you so you get the sort of basic concepts. Then we're going to look at some situations where liquid-liquid extraction might be preferred to distillation. So why would we want to use liquid-liquid extraction? Then we'll have a reminder about how we can represent ternary mixtures. And then a quick look at type 1 and type 2 systems, uh, hopefully most of which is just to remind you of stuff that you've done previously. And then we'll look how we actually think about calculating the equilibrium for one of these three component liquid-liquid systems, but just with a single stage. So as I mentioned last week, Liquid-liquid extraction, essentially what you have is you have a liquid and then that consists of two components mixed together. So that is your feed. Okay? You then add a solvent to that feed and you've carefully selected that solvent so that it pre it's preferentially likes one of the components in your feed mixture. That component then moves into the solvent. You've also carefully selected that solvent so that it is not miscible with your feed. Okay? And then they separate. And then you end up with two output streams. You end up with what's called an extract stream, which is basically your your solvent plus the extracted solute from your initial feed and you end up with a raffinate phase which is essentially your residual feed stream. Okay? So there's many situations in that we would actually prefer liquid-liquid extraction to distillation. Um, several of these can actually be... Oh, yep. So the raffinate is the remaining part of the feed solution. Okay? So I'll come back and explain these more fully as we go through as well anyway. So there's many situations that we might actually prefer liquid-liquid extraction over distillation. This can either be due to the fact that distillation is not possible because there's not enough separation between the boiling points of our systems, or there might be other issues within our system that prevents us from using distillation. So some of the key examples might be something like a dissolved or complex inorganic substances uh, in aqueous solutions. So if we've got very large quantities of water, water is incredibly expensive to heat and incredibly expensive to boil. Essentially the two things that you need to do a lot for distillation. So it's potentially going to be a lot cheaper if you can remove these inorganic or organic substances which are potentially dissolved at low concentrations out of that water phase without the heating or the boiling. Similarly, the situation with removal of contaminants. So if there are contaminants in small concentrations, it's often not economically viable to run distillation because you've got very small concentrations. So make, we can use liquid-liquid extraction to actually remove those, those contaminants. <coughs> if we've got very high, a very high boiling component present in our mixture, um, again in small quantities in aqueous waste streams, 
Again, distillation would be very difficult because we've got water to boil and also we've got a, very, a component with a very high boiling point. So that makes difficult, di distillation very difficult and distillation very expensive. So potentially we can use liquid-liquid extraction to remove that high boiling component away from our aqueous phase. So like one of the examples in the question set last week, recovery of heat sensitive materials. Uh, so they made materials, that the example was penicillin, and removing it from water, and in that case, the penicillin would decompose before we could boil the water away. One alternative would be to look at vacuum distillation, so we lower the boiling point that we need to remove the water. However, creating a vacuum can be very expensive, so potentially liquid-liquid extraction to actually remove that component out of the aqueous phase would actually be a much preferred option economically. And then as I mentioned at the start, potentially if we want to separate mixtures according to our chem chemical type. So if we can't separate them using their differences in relative volatility, maybe we can separate them based on differences in their solubility. So if we can, we can use liquid-liquid extraction to take advantage of the difference in the chemical type of the materials we have. So, and then some more specific examples. Uh, so we've got separation of mixtures that form azeotropes. So although there are some techniques for distillation to separate materials with azeotropes, and we do use those in industry, they often require two or three or even more distillation columns to do that. But maybe we can take advantage of actually just having a liquid-liquid extraction system which will actually remove what we want. So we only need that one separation rather than potentially three or four distillation columns to get around the problem with the azeotrope in the system. And then we have things like extraction of, of salts from polymers, extraction of metals from ores, and extractions of metal salts from wastewater. So again, it's all, it's all materials which are essentially dissolved in a liquid, so we don't necessarily want to put these in a distillation column, because with these being essentially dissolved solids, then the, the difficulty we have is that they may actually come out in the distillation column and actually, when we're heating it, and actually start to form fouling and deposits inside our distillation column. Also, if we've got materials like polymers, polymers, again, are subject to essentially decomposing at higher temperatures, so we don't want to start to heat necessarily all these polymers. Some are okay, but some are very heat sensitive. And then potentially things like recovery of nuclear fuels. So you've already got radioactive material for safety concerns. If something's all radi radioactive, maybe you don't want to start heating that up as well. So you don't want really hot, boiling radioactive material. Okay, so something like liquid, ex liquid extraction can be taken advantage of because you can essentially do that cold and at room temperature if you need to. So let's just have a think about that liquid-liquid extraction process in a little bit more detail, okay? So we essentially have our feed, which is our two components, or actually, although we're considering just two components in the feed, potentially there can be more. There can be three, four, five components in the feed, okay? So we can actually say that our feed is made up of a carrier, which we can see here in the blue, and then in the carrier is a, is a dissolved liquid, which we can call the solute. So that's these green dots here. Okay? So that's our feed. Then what we do is we add a solvent. 
So we've carefully selected our solvent so that our solvent is admissible with our carrier. Okay? But our solvent preferentially likes our solute. So what our solute wants to do is actually dissolve into our solvent. Okay? So to do that, we need to enhance the surface area in between these two liquids so we can actually get a useful rate of mass transfer. Okay? So we can do that in a variety of ways. We can, we can shake, we can mechanically shake it, we can stir it, we can put it over packing, which will break it up in terms of flows. Okay, we can, just bump, we can just put one of the phases in as droplets. Okay, but what we need to do is try and enhance the surface area between them. And then we essentially need to wait. And then what we do is we allow the solvent and the carrier to separate from each other. But now they've separated, hopefully our solute has now dissolved into our solvent and created our extract phase, whereas we now have our remaining carrier with very little solute in, which is the exiting raffinate phase. Okay? Does that make sense? Yep. So because we're automatically now dealing with a minimum of three components, we need to start representing our diagrams for these systems essentially on ternary diagrams. Okay? So you should have seen these before, so this is hopefully just a reminder to you. But if this is our ternary diagram space here, then what we can do is we say that our corners are actually the pure components. So in this case, we've selected this corner to be A, this one to be B, and this one to be C. Okay? And then what we do is we read the fraction of each of our three components from essentially the perpendicular lines. So... If we want to go for B, we take our component B. We can see that this axis here is the one directly opposite B. And then so we can read the fraction of B using the lines which are parallel to this axis or perpendicular to the B line. Okay? So in this case, you can see that they're actually labelled along the bottom. So this would be 0%, 20% B, 40% B, 60, 80, and then all the way to pure B being in this corner. Okay? And of course, we can do the same process for the other components. So if we take A, then this axis opposite A represents 0% A, so then we use the lines, the grid lines, parallel to that axis to read up until we get pure A. Okay? So when we're representing our actual ternary phase diagram on this system, okay, so what we can do is we can again use this and then we can actually represent a two-phase region, exactly like you've previously seen for a two-component system, but we can now do it for a three-component system. So in this case, what we've represented is we've actually represented a solvent, our carrier, and our solute. And you can see that our solute is soluble in both the solvent and the carrier, because there's no two-phase region here. But the solvent and the carrier are only actually very slightly soluble 
within each uh, they're only very slightly soluble within e with each other okay so because they're only slightly soluble they form a two phase region okay so anything inside this area here any composition inside this area splits into two liquid phases, two immiscible liquid phases. Okay? And the way that you determine the composition of those phases is these tie lines. So these tie lines tell you which composition of which phases are in equilibrium with each other. Okay? So if you add if you have a three-phase mixture anywhere on this red line, what happens is, if you leave it, it will separate into two liquid phases. One of them will have this composition here, and one of them will have this composition here. Okay? So there's a special point as well within our two-phase region, and that's essentially the very top of the two-phase region, where the two phases turn into a single phase because they're miscible, and that's the flat point. So at this point here, the composition of the two phases that are actually formed oh, is the first point where they're identical to each other. So as you move this way, the phases become identical, and then you pass out into a region where all three components mix together are stable as a, as a single liquid phase. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, good. So with these systems, what we, what we tend to do is divide them up into different types. Okay, so what we've just seen is called a type 1. Okay, so a type 1 is where two of our components, so in this case A and B, are partially immiscible with each other, and A and C and B and C, so the other pairs of components, mix with each other. So all we form is one single two-phase region, okay? A type 2 system is a little bit more complicated. So with a type 2 system, we have, again, one pair that are only slightly miscible with each other, but also one of the other combination pairs is slightly miscible with each other. So what we actually form as two two-phase regions, okay? Now, as we change the temperature in our system, we can actually, we actually change how soluble each of our components are with each other, okay? So, if we lower the temperature, generally they'll become less miscible or less soluble in each other, and what that does is that actually grows the, sh grows the size of that two-phase region. And it's possible that, these, that in this case, the two-phase regions here can actually grow large enough that they actually meet. Okay? So what we end up is, is forming one much larger two-phase region where anything in this section here essentially splits up into two, two liquid phases, one over here and one over here. So we've actually got these now three distinct regions within our ternary diagram. Okay? As well as this effect happening, we can also have this effect in this final diagram here, well, actually, what happens is... Oh, yep. This one. Yeah. So, say we take this diagram here. So, if we, say, do something like lower the temperature, then by doing that, we actually enhance how 
immiscible the liquids are together, okay? And what that does is it, it takes our two-phase region and it starts to grow the size of that region, okay? If we grow those regions large enough, what can happen is if we have two of those regions, is that they can actually meet and join together. So we now have one larger two-phase region. So what happens is, is any component, any mixture that falls in this two-phase region here splits up so that we have one component, one liquid phase over here and one liquid phase down here. Okay, so we've actually now divided this up essentially into two completely separated single phase miscible regions. Okay? <clears throat> so as well as the effect that we see in the third diagram, we can also have what happens in the fourth diagram. So depending on the direction of the tie lines of the two different two-phase regions, they can either, if they're, if they're essentially in the same direction, they can join together. But if they, if they essentially slant in opposite directions, then when they meet, that competes with each other. And what actually happens is, is you get the effect in the fourth diagram which is where you actually form these multiple two-phase regions, which are these regions here with the tie lines in. But in the middle of that, you actually form a three-phase region. Okay? So any composition that we mix in this inside triangle, if we leave it, it will actually separate into three immiscible liquid phases, okay? And the composition of those phases is always the corners of this triangle. So it will always be one of composition lowercase a, one of composition lowercase b, and one of composition lowercase c, okay? But we will, main, we will mainly be dealing with these systems over here because we don't really want a three-phase system to form within our liquid-liquid extraction system, okay? Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> just a very quick, just very quickly for about five minutes, if you can just quickly have a go. It's question R1 in the handbook or it's obviously on the screen. Uh, just to quickly remind yourself, just to see if you can plot these three points on the system. So, comes on, yep. So then just to quickly, because it's obviously the whole foundation of this part of the course, so it's important to make sure that you've all got this bit sorted. In fact, let me... Can you hear that? Is that okay? Yeah. Cool. So, so our first example was pure B. Yep. So, so as we mentioned, obviously the the corners of our pure components. So the simplest one there, just identify which corner is pure B, which is conveniently in this case labelled B for us. So we know that that is our first component compositions, okay? The second one was 70% B and 20% A. Now, hopefully, you notice that that doesn't add up to 100%. Yep. So we automatically know what fraction... Of, of our composition needs to be our final component C, which is 10%, okay? So, but we, so we can plot this on our system. So the first is 70% B. So if you remember, 
So B is here. The axis opposite represents 0% B. So the tie lines, uh, so the grid lines parallel to the axis represent the composition of B. So as we move up these grid lines, we're increasing the composition of B. Yep. So we can see the bottom axis follows those grid lines. So we want 70%, 50, 60, 70%. So we know it's somewhere along that dotted line. We also know it's 20% A, so we can do the same with our A. So this is A, 0%, 10% A, 20% A. So where those two meet, that is our second position. And then the final one was 0.1A, 0.5B, and 0.4C. So we can very easily convert that because our axis is in percentage. So we can very easily convert that on a percent basis. And then we just follow the same procedure as we did before. So 10% A, A, 0% A, grid lines parallel to that. So this is our 10% A line. Then 50% B. So B, 0%, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. So that's where it crosses. So that's our point three. And we can just do a quick check. 40% C, pure C, 0% C, 10, 20, 30, 40% C. Okay, so I've just gone through that because as I said, this is the most, this is the most important part because if you, if you just don't quite get your head around how you plot data on the ternary diagram, you essentially then can't move on to start solving actually how we plot the, the systems to solve for the liquid-liquid extraction, okay? So does that make sense? Yep. Um, so, yeah, so I want to move on to thinking about how we actually start to use this ternary data now to actually look at mass balances on the system. Okay, so if we think of our system, then essentially if we're just looking at a single phase, we essentially have just maybe a part or our device that we're using and what we put in is our feed which is made up of our carrier and our solute and we also put in our solvent okay then we mix that together and then we allow that to separate and then what we take out is our extract, which is our solvent with hopefully lots of solute. And our raffinate, which is hopefully just lots of the carrier. Okay? So we can do a simple overall mass balance on our system. So we know that what we add... So our feed and our solvent flow rates, they equal M, which is the, the total amount of our mixture. And then, because the only products that come out are the raffinate and the extract, we know that the amount of each that comes out has to also equal that total mixture. 
We can also do exactly the same process for every component within our system. Okay, so we can do our total mass balance and our component mass balance, where we take the, the composition of each component in those streams into account. So if we take our feed and solvent going in to start with, then if we take two of our components, so in this case, we're taking our solute, which we often refer to as A, and our carrier, which we often refer to as component C, then we can form these two balances. And what we can do is we can combine these together with our overall balance to give us this expression here, where we get the ratio of the feed to the solvent in terms of the compositions of our solute in our solvent, our total mix point and our feed, or equivalently in terms of our carrier in the solvent, the mix point and the feed. Okay? So we can actually rearrange this line, or we can actually rearrange this equation here, and we can actually rearrange it into this function at the bottom of the slide. Okay? Now, the interesting thing about this function at the bottom is that you can see that we have our composition of the carrier at our mix point and the composition of our, sol of our solute at the mix point. And then we have these two fractions, but all the data in these two fractions is actually made up with the compositions of those components, either in our solvent feed or in our main feed, okay? Either in our solvent or our feed, which is data we know. So if we look at this, we can actually think about this as a y equals mx plus c form. So what this is telling us is that if we know where our feed point is on our diagram, and we know where our solvent point is, uh, uh, yeah, solvent point is on our diagram, if we join those two points together with a straight line, that our total composition is somewhere on that straight line. Okay? And that brings us on to the lever arm rule, but the lever arm rule in, of three components. So we can now essentially find the position on that line by taking our feed to solvent ratio, and we can take any of our components. So in this case, we've gone back to our solute one, and then we've essentially gone, we've got feed to solvent, and it's our composition at S to our composition at M, which is essentially our S point to our M point distance, and we can do the same M point to F point get our f to m distance. So we can now know that we draw a straight line between our feed and our solvent, and we can either solve the composition of the mix point by a mass balance, or we can find the composition of the mix point by actually looking at the ratio of our feed to our solvent. Okay. Okay, so I want to look at this system as an example. So, switch back to this microphone. So, in this case, we've got a feed 
of 400 kilograms, and we know that it's 25% of our solute and 75% of our carrier. And we also have a solvent which we're mixing it with that in this case is all solvent. Okay? So what we can do is we can actually start off and find the, po the points for the feed and the solvent. Okay? So we know that our feed is 25% A and 75% C. So in this case, we've got our axis labeled. I find it a lot easier if we label the corners. So if this is our mass fraction of C increasing here, then we know that this corner is, our, is C, our carrier. The top is our solute A, and this corner is our solvent S. So our feed is 25% A. So 20% A is this line. So that's 30%, so 25% is about here. And we also know that our feed has 0% solvent in. This is our solvent, so this line is zero, this axis is 0%. So we know that this point here essentially represents our feed into the system. Okay? So we can also add our solvent. We know it's 100% solvent, so that's very easy to add. It's just this corner down here, okay? Now, if we join these two points together, then we know that our total composition must lie somewhere on this line. Okay? So what we can very simply do is take one of our components. So let's take uh, our component A, and we can do a simple mass balance on this. So we know that the A in our mix point times our total is equal to the amount that we put in in the feed plus the amount that we put in in the solvent. Okay? So we don't have any A in our solvent, but we do have 25% in our feed and a feed of 400 kilograms. Okay. We can do a total mass balance to find M because we simply know that M equals S plus F. So is 100 plus 400. So it's 500 kilograms. Yep. So that means that we can simply calculate that essentially 100 divided by 500 to say that our composition of our solute in the total is just 20%. Okay? So just a simple mass balance on our solute. So then what we can do is we can find 20% A, which is this line here. So we know that our mixed composition is somewhere on this line. We also know it's somewhere on the straight line between our F and our S. So basically we can draw the point on that line where it crosses the 
Okay? So we can very simply find... We can simply find our mixed composition for our system. Okay? So does that make sense? Yep. So now we've got our mixture and you can see that it falls within our two-phase region. Okay? Now, because our mixture falls within our two-phase region, it's not stable, so it separates into two liquid phases that are in equilibrium with each other. Okay? Now, if you remember, the tie lines that I mentioned before are essentially what two phases are in equilibrium with each other. Okay? So, what we can do is we can actually look we can actually look at our system and we can see that in this case our mixed point actually lies on one of our tie lines okay so what we know is that at this total composition this will actually split based on this tie line so we actually end up with two phases defined by those compositions in our system so we can define an extract phase and a raffinate phase okay and then if we want the composition of those phases, we can write that down essentially by reading off our diagram. So for R, we can see we're basically about 10% A. And for our carrier, we're basically about 86%. So we can fill in the, the rest. So our rest is our solvent, and that's about 4%. So we're just reading off the composition of our E and our R. Okay? We can do exactly the same for our extract. So here in this case, we've got 40% A. For our carrier, we've got about 10%. So for our solvent, we've got about 50%. Okay? So quite simply there, we've just used... We've just used the uh, information that we've got from our tie lines to actually be able to give us the actual composition of our two-phase system as they've actually separated. Okay? Now, if we want to, we can actually calculate the, 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 the amounts of each of our phases, and we can either do that again with a mass balance, or we could actually use the lever-arm rule of the ratio of E to M and M to R to actually find the compositions. So if we were to do that, we would say that E over R, the ratio of the two, is equal to the length of the line M to R over E to M. Okay? And we can just simply measure that and work out that ratio. Okay? 
broken. Okay, so today we essentially looked at systems where we would want to consider liquid-liquid extraction over distillation and also thought about the, the fundamentals of liquid-liquid extraction. We then moved on to thinking about representing this three-component system as a diagram. And then at the end, we looked at how we can do a single stage liquid liquid extraction, or essentially mixing our components together and allowing them to separate via the equilibrium on the tie lines. Okay? So next week, we'll build on that and we'll actually start to look at well, what if we now have a multi-stage liquid-liquid extraction process? Okay, so the equivalent you've done before is I have an evaporator and I've now transferred this into a distillation column. So a single equilibrium into a multi-stage equilibrium system. So that's what we'll do next week, but for liquid, liquid extraction, we'll move from this single stage equilibrium into a multi-stage system and then we'll find out how we calculate how many equilibrium stages we need for given specifications of a product. Okay? <clears throat>